He was a barbarian and a senator from South Carolina. His name was Preston Brooks. And on May 22nd, 1856, he beat Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner with a cane on the floor of the Senate in retaliation for Sumner's anti-slavery speech. Historians describe this as the moment the country was pushed to civil war. After the beating, with a thick cane that had a gold head, Sumner was knocked down, he was blinded by his own blood, and he collapsed, lapsing into unconsciousness. Brooks beat Sumner until his cane broke and then kept going. Well, thousands rallied in support of Sumner in Boston, Albany, Cleveland, Detroit, New Haven, New York, Providence. Over a million copies of Sumner's anti-slavery speech went nationwide. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the most influential writer of the time, said after the incident, I do not see how a barbarous community and a civilized community can constitute one state. I think we must get rid of slavery or we must get rid of freedom. While Sumner recovered, Southern leaders ridiculed him, accused him of cowardice for not returning to the Senate. Well, the Massachusetts General Court, they reelected him that November, but he couldn't last a day. His recovery took years. During the Civil War, Sumner became the leader of the radical Republicans, who at that time represented the North and were demanding an immediate permanent eradication of slavery without compromise. Abraham Lincoln described Sumner as my idea of a bishop and consulted him as an embodiment of the conscience of the American people. In April 1865, as the war was drawing to a close, Lincoln proposed voting rights for African Americans in the South, and he was assassinated days later. So Sumner and the radical Republicans, they demanded harsh measures in the South. They demanded more protections, civil rights, voting rights for freed men, and the elimination of any Confederate nationalism. They wanted to keep ex-Confederates from gaining political offices, from undoing the North's moral victory. And over the next decade, black Americans were voting in huge numbers. They elected 22 black men to serve in Congress, and they helped elect Ulysses S. Grant. The Southern Confederates, they responded with black codes laws designed to control Americans through a similar system to slavery. And in response, Sumner co-authored the Civil Rights Act of 1865. He did that with John Mercer Langston, who was the founding dean of the law school at Howard University. And that bill passed one year after Sumner's death, but it was never enforced. That would be the last civil rights legislation passed for nearly a century. Sumner's friends were always worried about his safety. They warned him, temper your statements. And Sumner left them with this parting advice. When crime and criminals are thrust before us, they are to be met by all the energies that God has given us, by argument, scorn, sarcasm, and denunciation. From the beginning of our history, the country has been afflicted with compromise. It is by compromise that human rights have been abandoned. A French missionary once wrote of the Haudenosaunee, no poor houses are needed among them. Their kindness, their humanity and courtesy not only makes them liberal with what they have, but causes them to possess hardly anything except in common. In the spring before the Revolutionary War, a message was signed by John Hancock. The American people are united and have taken the advice of the Iroquois. And as the Declaration of Independence was being drafted, the Haudenosaunee chiefs were invited to the Continental Congress. They were addressed as brothers, The colonists wished their friendship would continue as long as the sun shall shine and the waters run. They hoped to be as one people and have but one heart. And then the colonists asked for their support in a war against their king. The six nations of the Haudenosaunee were divided for the first time in a thousand years. To keep the peace, the British king had barred further European settlements west, to which George Washington had secretly written, I can never look upon that proclamation in any other light than as a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of the Indians. So the Mohawk, the Seneca, the Onondaga, and the Cayuga, they remained loyal to Britain. The Tuscarora and the Oneida sided with the colonists, while George Washington issued orders against all six nations, saying, quote, The immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements, the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops now on the ground and prevent their planting more lay waste all the settlements around, and do it in the most effectual manner, that the country may not be merely overrun, but destroyed. You will not by any means listen to any overture of peace before the total ruinment of their settlements is effected. Washington burned over 40 villages, 
fields, and stores. He commanded the destruction of the continent's oldest democracy. With half their population gone from Washington's campaign and resulting famine, the Seneca chief corn planter addressed him directly as follows. When your army entered the country of the Six Nations, we called you the town destroyer, devourer of villages. And to this day, when that name is heard, our women look behind them and turn pale, and our children cling close to the necks of their mothers. Within 13 years, the Haudenosaunee had been deprived of nearly all their land, forced north onto a few small reserves. While the British colonists had emulated the spirit of unity and compromise inspired by the Haudenosaunee, they still held fast to the caste and class systems of the feudal societies from whence they'd come. To this day, many still use the name Kanatakarius, devourer of villages, for the first president of the United States. One of this nation's founders of liberty goes by the name of Truth, Sojourner Truth. She was born around 1797. She named herself in 1843 when she was about 31. Truth didn't know the exact date of her birth or her family history because she was born a prisoner of a Dutch slaver in what would later be known as the New York Catskills. The Hardenburg estate, like so many slave plantations, met the definition of a concentration camp, a place imprisoning large numbers of persecuted people for forced labor or to await execution. Truth's parents, along with a group of lifelong captives, were held in the dark cellar of the main house. Because she was raised by her Dutch slavers, Truth spoke fluent Dutch, not English. That's why she didn't understand the orders being shouted at her when she was nine years old, after being auctioned off to a local storekeeper who severely beat her as punishment. After years of torture and abuse of all kinds, her captor promised to let her go on the 4th of July, 1826, when she turned 29 years old. But he broke his promise. Sojourner would later dictate in her autobiography, her conversations with God compelled her to take her infant daughter Sophia and go. Truth was assisted by another Dutch couple, and with their help, she went to the New York Supreme Court and won custody of her son, Peter, who she'd been unable to take with her. Truth became one of the first black women to win a case against a slaver, and she felt God was now compelling her to testify the hope that was in her. And so she began speaking and speaking and drawing larger and larger audiences. Year after year, decade after decade, she spoke and inspired and moved people, becoming one of the most influential leaders of the entire Civil War era. A Boston paper wrote of one of her speeches, seldom is there an occasion of more attraction or greater general interest. Every available space of sitting, standing room was crowded. When threatened by a mob in Northampton, Massachusetts, Truth just sang, bringing the crowd into a state of quiet. She scolded poorly raised, hissing white children, reminding them of their Bibles to honor their father and mother. She recruited troops during the Civil War to end slavery. She rode streetcars to protest segregation. She was invited to the White House to meet with President Lincoln. And after his assassination, she met with President Ulysses S. Grant. She spoke about women's rights, prison reform, the abolition of capital punishment, property rights. She tried to secure reparations in the form of land grants for enslaved Americans who were now set free. And she tried to vote, but she was turned away at the polls. When she left this world in 1883, the great abolitionist leader Frederick Douglass said truth had been for the last 40 years an object of respect and admiration to social reformers everywhere. Historian Martha Jones wrote that truth told her own stories ones that suggested a women's movement might take another direction, one that championed the broad interests of all humanity. May we honor the legacy of Sojourner Truth, one of our founding mothers of liberty, by carrying on the good work she started 150 years ago. One of the greatest media organizations in US history was The Liberator, launched in Boston in 1831, and published until the Constitution was amended and slavery was abolished. The paper was founded by a Canadian-born Christian, William Lloyd Garrison, who credited an 1826 Presbyterian Reverend John Rankin's book, Letters on Slavery, for igniting him to the anti-slavery cause. Garrison, he rejected the validity of any government engaged in war, imperialism, or slavery, and he wrote, quote, wherever there's a human being, I see God-given rights inherent in that being, whatever may be the sex or complexion, now, there were many calls for moderation and compromise with the slavers, to which Garrison wrote, 
I am aware that many object to the severity of my language. But is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. And I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. Confederates and their sympathizers, they burned Garrison in effigy. A gallows was erected in front of his office, but Garrison didn't stop. He wrote his editorials, setting them directly in type. He didn't even sketch out his thoughts first. Benefactors paid for copies to land on the doorsteps of state legislators, governors, congressmen, and at the White House. Garrison demanded immediate and total emancipation, ridiculing the slavers' insane demands for compensation. North Carolina indicted him for incendiary material. The Georgia legislature offered a small fortune for his capture. Confederate mobs stormed his anti-slavery meetings, his offices, they assaulted his lecturers, they burned his pamphlets, they destroyed his printing presses. One time they dragged him personally through the streets toward Boston Common by a rope until the mayor intervened. But Garrison would not stop. He published the trial and execution of anti-slaver hero John Brown. The great American abolitionist Frederick Douglass said, no face and form, ever impressed me with such sentiments as did those of William Lloyd Garrison. For Frederick Douglass, the liberator, held a place in his heart second only to the Bible. And after the Civil War was over and the 13th time the Constitution was amended, Garrison felt he could publish the last issue of the liberator, leaving what remains to be done to complete the work of emancipation to other instrumentalities with millions instead of hundreds for allies. But Frederick Douglass warned the battle had not yet been won. They must give all Americans a universal right to vote. I fear, Douglas proclaimed, that if we fail to do this now, if abolitionists fail to press it now, we may not see for centuries to come the same disposition that exists at this moment. It would be another hundred years before the country would see a Voting Rights Act and another hundred years of challenges to its enforcement that continue to this day. A hundred years before 1776, the British colonies of the Americas developed a new and more sinister form of slavery, unseen in the history of the world. This horrific practice had been common in almost every society, in every corner of the earth, for over 10,000 years. Slavery was the fate for prisoners of war, religious rivals. It was a punishment for debts or crimes, but there was no massive global slave industry. And the life of a slave in ancient history might have even been better than that of a peasant. But over the course of the Middle Ages, the practice became more widespread. The transatlantic slave trade targeted an entire race of people. Laws condemning people into slavery based on race were invented alongside a new economic system. European powers were no longer looking at just land and gold as the measure of wealth and power, but shifting to ownership of labor and production capabilities. Enslaved people became capital assets. People literally became property, treated like a commodity for trade, enriching their captors. This was new, and its origins were initially covered up and romanticized, buried underneath a fictional hero character painted as a working class champion, a guy named Nathaniel Bacon who supposedly led the Virginia colony's first patriotic insurrection against an oppressive British empire a hundred years before 1776. The true story has no heroes and inspired far worse forms of tyranny. Born in Suffolk, England in 1647, Bacon's dad shipped him off to Virginia for trying to steal their 16-year-old neighbor's inheritance. The Virginia colony was an unpleasant place. It was tough times, naval wars, terrible weather. Workers had been brought in from all over. Africans who'd been enslaved, so-called indentured servants, people paying off a free trip to the new world with years of labor, and then freedmen who'd paid off their debts. So thousands of people, black, white, working, eating, drinking together, and bonded through circumstance, through ill treatment by plantation owners, and violent conflict with the nations that they'd invaded. It was a perfect storm. In July 1675, Dogue natives raided a plantation near the Potomac River and the colonists retaliated, but they attacked the wrong tribe. 
The British governor, Berkeley, he set up a meeting under a flag of truce. John Washington, George Washington's great-grandfather, who was a first-generation British immigrant, he was the leader of the local militia. And following the massacre of five chiefs at that meeting under a flag of truce, the Susquehannas named John Washington Devourer of Villages, a name that would be passed on to his great-grandson. But that's another story. Governor Berkeley ordered the colonists to show restraint, but Nathaniel Bacon, he saw an opportunity to start seizing more land. So he falsely accused an Appomattox tribe of stealing corn. Berkeley reprimanded him, but drunk on brandy and delusions of grandeur, Bacon assembled a militia and convinced a group of Okanichi allies to help him fight a group of Susquehannas. Once he'd won the Okanichis over, he killed them and destroyed their village. And then he attacked the Virginia government. Well, John Washington at this point, supported Governor Berkeley, so Bacon's army plundered Washington's estate as well. Bacon's army was a united labor class, white and black. Together, they burned Jamestown to the ground. This was the largest colonial rebellion before 1776. Even after Bacon died of a sudden attack of body lice and dysentery, his men kept going until English ships threatened bombardment. The last hundred rebels left were 80% black and 20% white. Well, the white British plantation owners were terrified and passed new laws distinguishing between African and European laborers, legislating Africans as hereditary slaves and would rely less on paid labor of any kind, creating a caste system that divided, conquered, and terrorized. Exactly a hundred years later, in 1776, when the British colonies declared independence again successfully this time, they did not extend that independence to those they'd enslaved or those they'd overpowered and conquered. The first lands in the world to outlaw slavery would be Haiti, Mexico, Denmark, Britain, Spain, the Netherlands, France, Portugal, Chile. All would be lands of the free before the United British colonies, who would not legislate voting rights for all Americans until less than 60 years ago. Our true Independence Day isn't really July 4th, 1776, but August 6th, 1965. And the seedlings of an independent United States started by Bacon's rebellion was no heroic start to overthrowing tyranny, but one of the origin stories of a whole new form of it. The origin of Ebenezer Scrooge and the modern image of Santa Claus. As a little child, Charles Dickens worked in a shoe factory. He was 10 years old. His father was in a debtor's prison, so Charles could only visit him on Sundays. And when Dickens grew up, it was a time of financial hardship, and Charles was horrified to read the work of an economist named Thomas Malthus, who used Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection as an allegory against assisting those struggling financially. When hearing there are some who would rather die than be sentenced to the workhouses, Scrooge channels Malthus replying, quote, well, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Dickens, at first, he considered writing a pamphlet called An Appeal to the People of England on Behalf of the Poor Man's Child. But instead, he wrote a Christmas carol in the spring of 1843 with the intention that it be a sledgehammer he wrote it about a miserly, grumpy old tycoon who turns his life around after seeing the way the past connects to the present and the future. The year prior, Dickens had also taken a trip to America, and he was so repulsed by the sight of slavery, he cut short his visit to the American South rather than continuing on to Charleston, South Carolina, as he'd previously planned. He wrote, quote, When we reach Baltimore, we're in the regions of slavery. It exists there in its least shocking and most mitigated form. But there it is. They whisper here. They dare only whisper, you know? And that below their breaths, that on that place and all through the South, there's a dull, gloomy cloud on which the very word seems written. I shall be able to say one of these days, that I accepted no public mark of respect in any place where slavery was." End quote. In the North, Dickens described visiting a Pennsylvania prison. He said it was cruel and wrong, 
but I'm persuaded that those who devised this system of prison discipline do not know what it is that they are doing. In A Christmas Carol, Dickens writes the character of Jacob Marley, his former business partner, now deceased, haunting Scrooge as a ghost, weighed down by, quote, cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. But in the end, Scrooge does turn his life around before it's too late, and he gives Bob Cratchit a raise and the family a Christmas turkey. Not a goose, a whole turkey. The Victorians called the Christmas Carol a new gospel, probably the most famous work on the celebration of Christmas ever written. Ebenezer Scrooge was a fictional character in the same sense as Father Christmas or Santa Claus, of which one of the first modern images was created in the middle of the Civil War, 20 years after the writing of A Christmas Carol, by the Bavarian immigrant and genius cartoonist Thomas Nast. He's the one who first immortalized the mythic figure of Santa, wearing the stars and stripes of the Union Army. Ulysses S. Grant, the Union General and then President of the United States, subsequently made Christmas the first ever federal holiday to bring the nation back together. Grant said of the cartoonist's famous images throughout the period that he, quote, did as much as any one man to preserve the Union and bring the war to an end, end quote. The characters of Scrooge and Santa are allegories for two kinds of spirits from which humankind can choose. As we begin to plan our New Year's resolutions, may we choose the path in favor of human values over any others. And in the words of Tiny Tim, a Merry Christmas to all, and God bless us, everyone. There was once a 27-year-old migrant farm worker named Daniel Shays. He was trained by the Massachusetts militia, but he didn't have any prospects. So when wealthy landowners rallied for revolution against their king, he joined their cause. He fought in the first battle at Lexington, the shot heard around the world. He fought at Bunker Hill, the battle that gave the colonists hope. And he fought in Saratoga, surrounded by British forces, and won, which gave the French the confidence they needed to support the cause which led to Britain's defeat. Shea's two years of leadership and courage in heavy combat earned him commendations and a promotion from sergeant to lieutenant. And when the war was over, Daniel Shays was outraged by the oppressive taxation without representation, not at the hands of the British, but the newly independent states who'd borrowed massive amounts from Europe for financing their revolution and were now facing a debt crisis. There were so many veterans that hadn't been paid for their service when state governments started seizing their property for unpaid taxes. There was a widow of a vet who'd taken ill. Her bed was confiscated out from under her while she was asleep. So Shays and his brothers, they began marching peacefully, demanding reprieve. George Washington, he feared what he called combustibles in every state and warned, we are fast verging to anarchy and confusion. So he came out of retirement and he met secretly with a group of wealthy landowners to resolve the crisis. They needed to establish a new set of laws, empowering a stronger central government to collect taxes effectively and stop Daniel Shays and what they felt was anarchy spreading across the land. So they wrote in their new constitution that the federal government may call out the militia to suppress rebellion and insurrection. And a few years later, they ratified an amendment to ensure their states kept those militias well regulated. And in 1794, George Washington himself called 12,000 state militiamen under federal control to crush the final anti-tax revolt, which had spread like wildfire all the way to Western Pennsylvania. The Honorable Daniel Shays was smeared as an anarchist by the Boston press. And for many years, they've called George Washington the father of the nation. There's another argument to make, that the war hero who inspired a constitution and a stronger central government was really Daniel Shays. The symbol of the United States, besides the flag, is our Statue of Liberty. It was given to us by France for winning the Civil War. At her feet are a chain and shackles symbolizing the abolition of slavery. Lady Liberty is her name, but she has another one that was given to her by Emma Lazarus. She's the writer of the lines on the bronze plaque underneath the symbol of our nation. Emma was a Sephardic Jewish American. Her ancestors include the first 23 Portuguese Jews who arrived in New York all the way back when it was a Dutch colony called New Amsterdam. 
Her family had to flee Brazil to escape the Portuguese Inquisition. Emma started writing poetry when she was just a teenager. One of her first describes the capture and death of John Wilkes Booth, the Confederate sympathizer and assassin of Abraham Lincoln. Emma curses John Wilkes Booth, saying, quote, Go forth, thou shalt have here no rest again, for thy brow is marked with the brand of Cain. She refers to the biblical story where Cain kills his brother over greed and jealousy. When Emma Lazarus wrote her poem in 1883, there was, just like there is now, so much hostility to another wave of immigrants. In that moment, they were coming from Greece and China, Russian Jews, Italians. A mass migration was taking place all over the world as people were moving from farms into cities to be part of a new era of industrialization. The poet James Russell Lowell told Emma Lazarus that her sonnet had given Lady Liberty its entire reason for being. The name she gave it and the sonnet was the new Colossus. She was referencing the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this mythic giant statue that guarded the Greek islands in the turmoil that followed the death of Alexander the Great. Emma's sonnet defines the new Colossus at New York Harbor, between our twin cities of New York and the former Dutch village of Brooklyn. The full sonnet goes like this. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman, with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows world-wide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore send these the homeless Tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Our founding father of voting rights for all Americans, Dr. Martin Luther King, said, quote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, never again. Can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea? Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. And now he speaks to the people who are criticizing the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham. And he says, I'm sorry to say, your statement fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I'm sure that none of you would want to rest content with the kind of superficial analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. He then goes on to explain why it's so important for political movements to use direct action, why sit-ins, marches, and so forth. Isn't negotiation a better path? King says you are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, that is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent, Direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. 
Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue, end quote. Dr. King, before he was assassinated, called for the full weight of the nonviolent movement to go to Washington and demand the total eradication of poverty for all Americans and a second Bill of Rights, the kind Roosevelt called for in between defeating the Nazis, taking the country out of depression, and creating a middle class. The problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. And it didn't cost the nation one penny to integrate lunch counters. It didn't cost the nation one penny to guarantee the right to vote. But now we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation spending billions of dollars and undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. Yes, yes. If a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty and the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. He merely exists. Anti-American is a pretty ridiculous thing to call an American, especially James Baldwin, a New Yorker, one of our greatest American writers, who said, quote, I love America more than any country in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. And Baldwin said that a decade before Martin Luther King Jr. was finally able to get the U.S. government to protect basic voting rights for all Americans. That was less than 60 years ago. Noam Chomsky, our most accomplished American linguist, he explained the meaning of the phrase anti-American, that the concept is used by people who favor total subservience to state dictatorships. For example, Chomsky says, quote, in the old Soviet Union, dissidents were condemned as anti-Soviet. That's a natural usage among people with deeply rooted totalitarian instincts. In contrast, people with even the slightest concept of democracy treat such notions with ridicule and contempt. Imagine someone in Italy criticizes Italian state policy condemned as anti-Italian. It's too ridiculous to even merit laughter, maybe under Mussolini, but surely not otherwise. Chomsky goes on to explain its earlier origins. It was used in the Bible by King Ahab, the epitome of evil, to condemn those who sought justice as anti-Israel. In the original Hebrew, roughly hater of Israel or disturber of Israel. King Ahab's specific target was Elijah. Elijah was not in fact anti-Israel, but a prophet. When people ask where can they read real American history, one of my favorite books is These Truths by Jill Lepore. And it's written like a piece of poetry. Here's an excerpt. Quote, during his stay in Washington, Charles Dickens, who'd started out as a police reporter, he visited the House and Senate every day, sitting in the galleries, taking notes. Quote, both houses are handsomely carpeted, he allowed, and the Senate was dignified and decorous. Its deliberations conducted with much gravity and order. But meetings at the House of Representatives, he said, were the meanest perversion of virtuous political machinery that the worst tools ever wrought. Its members were cowardly, petty, cussed and degraded. Dickens, for all the flair of his pen, had by no means exaggerated. Although hardly ever reported in the press, the years between 1830 and 1860, this is just prior to the Civil War, saw more than 100 incidents of violence between congressmen, from melees in the aisles, to mass brawls on the floor, from fistfights and duels to street fights. Quote, it is the game of these men and of their profligate organs, Dickens wrote, to make the strife of politics so fierce and brutal and so destructive of all self-respect and worthy men that sensitive and delicate-minded persons shall be kept aloof, and they, and such as they be, left to battle out their selfish views unchecked. In other words, reasonable people were kept out of politics entirely. Doesn't sound that different than now. Dickens knew a rogue when he heard one and a circus when he saw one. Nearly as soon as the war with Mexico began, members of Congress began debating what to do when it ended. They spat venom. They pulled guns. They unsheathed knives. Divisions of party were abandoned. 
and the splinter in Congress was sectional. Before heading to the Capitol every morning, Southern congressmen strapped Bowie knives to their belts and tucked pistols in their pockets. Northerners, on principle, came unarmed. When Northerners talked about the slave power, they meant that literally. If the United States were to acquire territory from Mexico, and if this territory were to enter the Union, would Mexicans become American citizens? Senator Calhoun, a slaver from South Carolina, opposed this idea, saying, quote, I protest against the incorporation of such a people. Ours is the government of the white man. And what about the territory itself? Would those former parts of Mexico enter the Union as free states or slave? In 1846, David Wilmot, a 32-year-old Democratic congressman from Pennsylvania, who looked as meek as a schoolmaster, suggested that a proviso be added to any treaty negotiated to end the war, decreeing that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any territories acquired through the war with Mexico. In 1846, the Wilmot Proviso passed 83 to 64 in the House, a vote that fell entirely along sectional rather than party lines. The Massachusetts abolitionist and staunch opponent of the war, Charles Sumner, predicted the proviso was going to lead to a new crystallization of the parties in which there shall be one grand Northern party of freedom. Supporters of the Wilmot Proviso argued slavery and democracy could not coexist. It is not a question of mere dollars and cents, said one Wilmot supporter in the House. It's not a mere political question. It is one in which the North has a higher and deeper stake than the South possibly can have. It is a question whether in the government of the country, she shall be borne down by the influence of your slave-holding aristocratic institutions that have not in them the first element of democracy, end quote. Jill Lepore is making the point again and again and again, that the central conflict in all of American history has been, and still is, the issue of slavery. 